watching the ZNS Network, the People's Station. Coming up in the news, violence against children addressed by the Grand Bahama Christian Council. Also, a family seeking justice for a loved one. And the police maintaining a relationship with the public. We'll tell you how. The Bahamas Tonight, the Northern Edition, starts now. This is the Bahamas Tonight, Northern Edition. Good evening, Bahamas. I'm Shoshina Roll Parkinson. As always, it is so great to have you with us. Topping the news, a leading clergyman is calling on Bahamians to take better care of the children in the country. This coming as he condemned recent incidents of violence against children, calling it a moral outrage. President of the Grand Bahama Christian Council says those involved must be held to account. Romiko Knowles has more. What drives a person to aim a firearm at an innocent young child and claim their life? President of the Grand Bahama Christian Council, Reverend Dr. Robert Lockhart, responding to that question and gives his thoughts on what he believes should be done. Christian Council leader, Pastor Robert Lockhart says, it is an unfortunate circumstance that the country is in, as children have become victims of crime, some wounded by gunfire and others shot to death. In June of this year, a two-year-old girl was left in critical condition after she was shot in Eleuthera. Late this September, another shooting incident occurred where a seven-year-old boy's life was cut short in the nation's capital. The most recent fatal shooting is a 10-year-old girl, also in New Providence. Lockhart says it's sad to say that the society has produced persons who have lost their humanity. Yeah, I think when you've come to the place that you can kill innocent children for whatever reason, um, um, either to cause pain to someone else um, um, or to satisfy some anger or frustration or rage or whatever, then I think at that sense that person have lost their sense of humanity. At that point, that person is um, almost becoming monstrous in their, um, in their behavior, in their conduct. Um, and it's sad to see that we have those type of persons in our community. Pastor Lockhart says such violent acts, especially against children, should spark public outrage, regardless of where the incident may have occurred. There ought to be marches in the street. We ought to, the, the communities in which it took place ought to be outraged. And then the rest of the community, the island, ought to be outraged. And these are things that we need to have godly indignation for. The Christian Council president says when a person has reached to the point where they can cause harm to an innocent child, that person is morally corrupt, mentally disturbed, have lost all fear of God, empathy towards others, and their soul. He says society should rid itself of such people. I'm one of those persons that do believe in capital punishment. I believe that the Bible teaches that under certain circumstances, capital punishment is necessary. And I would think that, um, um, I think right now, the previous consul, uh, they didn't out um, um, say that um, capital punishment or the death penalty is, is, is not um, uh, constitutional in the Bahamas, but what they said, it ought to be reserved for the worst of crimes. And I think killing an innocent child for no reason, and there never could be a reason to kill an innocent child, um, I think that registers amongst the worst of crimes. He says the only solution for such persons is God. We need to reach wherever these persons are, whichever parts of our society they live or move or dwell. It is my prayer that, um, um, that the grace of God, the message of the gospel um, 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 could reach these persons because I believe it takes the power of God to, to turn these persons' hearts around. He makes this appeal to anyone who may feel the need to retaliate in such a manner. No matter how angry you get, no matter how um, frustrated you are with the situation, um, um, to take it out on innocent children is, um, is unacceptable. And, um, um, and I think at, at that point, like I said, you've, you've lost your soul, you've lost your humanity. And as human beings, we need to conduct ourselves humanly. And as human beings, um, 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 we can get frustrated, we can get angry. Um, sometimes we find ourselves being hateful or vengeful, but we cannot um, um, express our emotions and our feelings to such a level that we have no regard for life, especially innocent life, when we're talking about children. Rumiko Knowles, ZN Network News. 
Justice for Monet. It is a slogan that is beginning to resonate throughout Grand Bahama as the family of the young mother who was brutally murdered a year ago say that it is unfair that her alleged killer is now on bail six months after the horrendous crime was committed. Tonight, they are calling for swift justice, not just for their family, but anyone who was murdered and their loved ones are facing the same pain. It has been an extremely difficult year for Kathleen Darvel and Tyler Williams, the mother and daughter of 30-year-old Monet Darvel, who was brutally stabbed to death last September. Kathleen says she spoke with Monet earlier that day and never imagined that it would be the last time that she would hear her daughter's voice. She recalls that fateful and earth-shattering moment when she received the phone call that Monet had been stabbed, allegedly, by her boyfriend, Kenrick Hanna. You're heading there and I'm imagining that you thought she was still alive. Yeah, I was just praying, driving and praying, and I was just saying, God, just keep her. I said, God, just keep her alive until I get there. Just keep her alive. And God there, and met, there were a lot of police was already there. And then I was thinking that the ambulance would have been there, but there were no ambulance. And they wouldn't allow me to go upstairs to the apartment. I told them I just wanted to see her. I wanted to get to her to make sure she was okay. And they told me, no, I couldn't go. I had to stay downstairs and just wait and just hope for the best. And we were just there. I was praying and just praying and praying and just asking God just to keep her alive. For one hour, she says, she waited and waited. And the dreaded news finally came. She <laughs> didn't make it. She would have passed right there. Right there. Yeah, she never made it to the hospital. Although it is unknown exactly what took place in the apartment, a video went viral on social media with the suspect threatening to take his own life by jumping from the second story building. But the family says what is most heartbreaking about this tragic situation is the fact that the suspect was formally charged and within six months, he was back on the streets after receiving bail. It just can't be real, like he's out on bail and no. had to put the case off because they didn't have his file present. The case was adjourned for another two weeks. Just, just so sad. Cousin Owen Darvel believes it is simply unfair. He was given bail and he is free and roaming in the city of New Providence. And, you know, if people don't know, they just don't know. And I think it's a, it's a slap in the face to her mother, to her daughter, to her brother, and, you know, to her family at large. It, it's very painful. A candlelight vigil was held in honor of Monet Darwell on September 24th, exactly one year after she was tragically killed. Yeah, we just enjoyed videos and pictures, um, watching uh, a few slideshows of her, um, which of course was kind of an emotional roller coaster for us all. She was always a, a happy, free-spirited, she was a fashionista, she was an exceptional mother. And, um, you know, being a close-knit family, she, she will be sorely missed for a very, very long time. She, she was an awesome person. The family says they will never forget her. They are making this impassioned appeal to the powers that be. I think that the first thing that we would want is for the case to have a date. Right now they don't have one. And for the ball to be rolling with this case, yes, we do know that we're in a pandemic. Um, and we do know that things are a bit slow right now. But I think for the crime of murder, it should be some level of importance to that and it should be done expeditiously. ZNS News has learned that bail was granted to the suspect in this case because he is confined to a wheelchair and is considered a reduced risk to abscond. 
Well, the issue of bail was addressed in the House of Assembly today as the Minister of National Security moved an amendment to the Bail and the Juries Act. The Bahamas is one of the first Caribbean countries to enact the bail legislation, which is largely based on British Act of 1976. Tonight, the Minister of National Security shares why the government is seeking to enhance the Bail Management Act through a biometric system. The Minister of National Security, the Honorable Marvin Dame, says this administration is seeking to amend the Bail Act to improve the existing system. He says while crime trends are down, communities continue to be outraged by malicious acts of violence and the bail management system is critical to the functioning of justice. To deprive one of their liberty would be in itself an offense. Therefore, we cannot deny a person the fundamental rights particularly if they have not been found guilty. The fact that a person does not get bail will not affect the final determination of guilt or innocence, which will ultimately be made by a court of law. He says this new biometric system will have a number of capabilities that will better monitor and track persons in the system in an efficient and secure way, adding that it will provide a platform in which persons can apply for bail. In the following categories, allowing suspect to comply with their bail conditions under their photograph and fingerprint recognition, a preventative component which seeks to discontinue shorters from signing bail for more than one person, preventing persons from impersonating suspects and signing the registers at the police stations, and it will digitally track any breaches of the bail conditions. This advancement in technology will be monitored by a local behemoth company that will have the ability to track all information in relations to bail for applications to regular sign-ins, reports, and to monitoring whether a surety has signed for someone previously. Dames adds in the last five years, Per year, on average, 664 persons were granted bail by the respective courts in the Bahamas, noting that 2018 was the highest on record for persons granted bail, with 939 persons followed by 2017 when 809 persons were granted bail. Dames notes that this new amendment will also give certain privileges to magistrates. And remove the bottleneck effect, which impedes the pipeline of the sector. The new amendment seeks to increase jurisdictions of the magisterial court to grant bail in relations to offenses listed in Part D of the first schedule. The magisterial court will have the ability to grant bail for possession of prohibited weapons and ammunition as listed in Section 30 of Chapter 213 of the Firearms Act. The unlawful shorting of guns offenses noted in the third schedule and so on. And it will also address the issue of sureties. It was important to address this area in the new bail access, bail management system if the, if the changes were to be significant. The noted clause will amend section 13, subsection 2 of the principal act to require a surety to utilize the bail management system for the purpose of making his or her sta statutory declaration. In par paragraph B, the words utilize the bail management system too will be inserted after the words require the surety too. This too will, will replace the archaic paper-based registration, which the surety also used. The Minister of National Security adds that this new amendment also seeks to eliminate the loopholes on bail conditions, like persons not producing their license when they sign in or sending someone else to sign in on their behalf. Well, the Royal Bahamas Police Force is doing its part to maintain a relationship with the members of the public. The police conducting a walkabout today throughout the 8 Mile Rock community. The top brass using the opportunity to speak to residents and find out their concerns as they attempt to enforce the emergency order protocols. Jamil Mizek was there. 
Throughout Bahamas Police Force on Grand Bahama making its presence felt in the Eight Mile Rock community. Assistant Commissioner of Police and Officer in Charge of the North Ashton Greenslade says it's all a part of their community policing initiative. We out here to meet and interact with the residents of the Eight Mile Rock community. Uh, we want to discuss with them the importance of obeying the, pro the COVID-19 protocol and also to find out any other concerns that they may have. Uh, while we're out here, we're going to hand out some masks, some free masks, and we're going to also hand out some flyers to sensitize them on the importance of obeying the curfew and to practicing uh, the, the protocol, the COVID-19 protocol. We'll also speak to our elderly folks and those folks who are unable to come to the police station. We're out here this morning to speak with them. ACP Greenslade says community policing is very important because it's through community policing that they're able to do their traditional policing in a more effective and efficient manner. What we're doing here this morning, our commanders do it on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis, they're up and about in their community walking. Uh, it's just that the top team out this morning and uh, we try to do it once per month, the top team. Right. But the commanders do it on a weekly basis a daily basis on their divisions. The police chief explains why they chose to walk about the Eight Mile Rock community. We're, we're based in Freeport, headquarters in Freeport. Eight Mile Rock is some distance away. We don't want the Eight Mile Rock to be neglected. That's why we take time out of our busy schedule to leave Freeport and come here in the community of Eight Mile Rock where we'll spend the rest of the day with them. We're going to ask them to comply with the curfew, to be in their residence at 10 p.m and don't be out before 6 a.m. Okay. We're going to ask them to wear their mask and we're leading by example. We bring some masks and to give away to them. We're going to ask them to wear their masks and we're going to ask them not to be in bars and clubs at 10. We're going to ask them to practice social distancing and uh, the rest of it. Now, ACP Greenslate notes that for the most part, residents have been complying with the emergency orders. But he says those who are not, once they are found, they will be arrested and prosecuted. Jamila Mizek, Satanas Network News. And some good news here, more than a year after Hurricane Dorian left East Grand Bahama in darkness, electricity has been restored. McLeanstown, the last settlement on the mainland of Grand Bahama, was re-energized this past Friday. Communities of Pelican Point, Rocky Creek and High Rock were energized several weeks ago. Now, even though the power company has re-energized the area, each structure must be approved by the Ministry of Works before it can be connected to the power system. GB Power says its team will now focus on restoring electricity to Deepwater Key and Sweetings Key. But the power company has lost a significant percent of its customer base. Prior to Hurricane Dorian, the power company had around 300 customers. But since the devastation of the storm, the number has now dropped to close by 75%. Declaration that the gates of the Bahamas are blessed. We declare that according to Isaiah 60 and 11, Isaiah 26 and 2, Numbers 6 and 24, the gates of the Bahamas are open continually to Jehovah God. We declare that the gates of the Bahamas are righteous and only the righteous altars will be erected in our nation. We declare that our gates are strong and will never be broken. We declare that our gates are watched and protected by God. We declare that the wealth of the nation will enter through our gates consistently and increase our land. We declare that the gates of the Bahamas are blessed of the Lord and his face shines upon them always. we come back, a new principal heading St. Paul's Methodist College, that story and more when we return. Please be advised of the following return dates for 8 Mile Rock High School students from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Grades 7 and 10, October 5th. Grades 8 and 11, October 6th grades 9 and 12 on October 7th. 
Let's get back to school. Things might have changed a bit, but Bethel Superstore is still here to make it happen for you. They see and understand the challenges you may have as a result of the current global issue. So they're doing their part to make shopping easier for you with BethelSuperstore.com. Just go to BethelSuperstore.com to place your order and pay online. Not easy enough? Well, get this. They even deliver. They even deliver. All throughout the Bahamas. And they've got every textbook you need. And if it's not in stock, they'll get it for you. They'll get it for you. That's right. So get on those laptops, smartphones, and tablets and go to BethelSuperstore.com. BethelSuperstore.com. To get all your textbooks and school supplies today. Bethel Superstore store number 352-2665. BethelSuperstore.com. BethelSuperstore.com. Right solution, right price. New Providence and Family Islands? Get bonus data with every purchase of select Freedom or Liberty plans. Alive, believe, invest. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to effectively respond to this enemy COVID-19 by promoting public health and safety, encouraging community participation and social mobilization and inspiring hope. the North. The Bahamas Tonight, Northern Edition. Welcome back. Another private school on Grand Bahama is in the swing of things. The institution has endured a lot of challenges and is now trying to adapt to a new reality. Jay Philippe has more. It's back to school as St. Paul's Methodist College officially reopened their doors for school. This time under new leadership as new principal Jackie Pinder says her aim is to ensure that each child is afforded a fair opportunity whether e-learning or in person. Jacqueline Pinder is no stranger to St. Paul's Methodist College. The newly appointed principal started her teaching career at St. Paul's where she spent 16 years at the primary school and junior high level. For me this opportunity is one that um, I feel honored to be um, doing and secondly I believe for me it is a paying forward. Education, the education has been good to me, both public and private. And so with that said, I believe that there is so much more for me to offer to education. And so here we are. Pinder previously served as principal at Walter Parker Primary School with a new role at St. Paul's and the challenges that COVID-19 has had on education. She says that St. Paul's has adapted to the online learning platforms that the Ministry of Education has approved. During this COVID-19 times, we realized that we are teachers, we are challenged to be, to, 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 to think out of the box. We got to be more open-minded in our approach because I, I describe this, this experience as an uh, ever rolling ball because every single day we have to adapt and change and make a new our, our strategies and the way that we teach. Pinder says they are allowing students to make broad and deep connections of basic ideas in and across disciplines. In these kinds of times, students need structure. They need to know what will happen from day to day and how that will happen. So we've been working very hard in the last few weeks to make sure that um, students come into a school that we are right now talking the plan, uh, working out the plan, and you know, without a plan, of course, it'll fail. So we have a plan in mind to um, create kind of environment, one that is, 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 is conducive to excellence. She also adds that the cadre of teachers this year at St. Paul's is rather unique. We have persons who would have retired and returned, like myself, and then there are students, um, there are teachers who have never taught before. So we, 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 it's a good mix. We're going to have the old and the new and a good mix of us gleaning from each other because none of us know everything and none of us have all the answers. So um, I believe this diverse group 
Um, we have um, our sessions, our professional dialogue is one of, of energy, is one of creativity. Um, our teachers are, are just ready, ready to go, and so am I. I'm Jay Philippe, ZNS, Network News. Well, students at the Lewis Yard Primary School all smiles today after receiving a donation of tablets from the Kiwanis Club of Freeport and the Buddy Heald Foundation. Kiwanis Club President Sonia Nesbitt says each year the club hosts a medical and dental screening and back-to-school giveaway. However, this year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, they were unable to do so. And that is why they decided to give back to the Lewis Yard community. We just gave a back to school giveaway in this area with food um, items about two weeks ago. So today we are here and we are going to present the principal of the school with 65 Kindle tablets which would um, help students of the school seeing that um, they won't be able to have face to face classroom but I know the Kendall would do good with them. She had requested 65 and we are able to meet that number today. And so 65 tablets would be donated to the school. Well, CEO of the Buddy Heald Foundation, Jaleesa Heald, says that they are pleased to partner with the Kiwanis Club for the donation. Meantime, Principal of Lewis Yard Primary, Juanita Hanna, says with this donation, as well as the help of other generous donors, all of their students will receive a tablet. We hope it really goes a mighty long way, um, especially in relation to this virtual learning and most importantly to the kids' future. We are really excited about the donation today from the Kiwanis Club and you know, we are in the era of COVID and the use of tablets is essential for our students so we are really, really excited about this donation this morning. We know that parents have had a challenging time economically and so this donation today is a tribute, a tribute to the dedication of the community to the students of Lewis Art Primary and it still means so much to the parents and the students to receive a very good education using the technology. And in other news, the C.A. Smith International Educational and Community Development Scholarship Foundation awarding seven bright and talented young Bahamians with scholarships. Attorney David Thompson says the disciplines that the scholarship recipients will study have a direct impact on the environment and technological advancement of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Smith Foundation went above its intended for scholarship quota to award seven deserving Bahamian students this year, proving its commitment to education even in the midst of a global pande the pandemic. We thank all recipients, their parents, family members, and friends for supporting the award recipients. And to the successful awardees, we say that they and other students like them represent our most valuable resource and best hope for the future of our country. Now the scholarship recipients were on hand to accept their checks and the young women are eager and excited about their future. It, it feels amazing to be honest because this year has been really discouraging for the class of 2020 and to know that there's still hope. It means a lot to me, to be honest. I'm studying environmental studies and political science in the hopes of becoming an environmental lawyer. Because I see that in the Bahamas, a lot of our environmental laws aren't like followed and we need more policies that are in place to protect our environment. Well, I've always had an interest in early childhood education. I have a big family and we have a lot of young family members, so I feel like it's close to the heart. And I've always, like I said, I've always had interest in helping children, so I feel like that's the right career choice. Very grateful for something like this because it's going to help me pursue my career goals. So this is a very good help. And a special congratulations to those recipients. We'll be back in just a moment. Esquire Men's Freeport has 20 to 50% off blazers during the month of October while supplies last. Call them at 727-6367. 
It's the beginning of the hurricane season and Fidelity Bank is giving you one less thing to worry about. We're not able to control a storm or its path, but we can prepare for it as much as possible. With every debt consolidation loan, Fidelity is giving away fully loaded hurricane kits valued at $200 with all the hurricane essentials you'll need to weather the unexpected storms of life. It's that easy. Sign up for a debt consolidation loan, open an ASO savings or fixed deposit, and walk away with a free hurricane kit. At Fidelity, we're committed to helping you through these difficult times. Fidelity. Visit Mo Divas for beauty accessories and apparel with two locations to serve you at number 7 Rachel's Britannia Mini Mall and East Sunrise Shopping Plaza where you'll also find a fine selection of men's apparel. Cash now? Visit Cash with GB Trading Posts on Explorer's Way. Your number one news team covering the North. The Bahamas Tonight, Northern Edition. West Little and New Providence is our Facebook friend of the day. West is celebrating a birthday and we hope that you are having a great one. Also, this one is for Irene Sanders over there on Fire Road. Thank you so much for watching. And that's going to do it for us here in the North. The Bahamas Tonight continues.